Um, we've now got uh, David Scott, who's talking about uh, applying Agile in, in real-world scenarios. Um, uh, Alyssa apparently was going to do jointly present it, but uh, she's uh, had to be a late withdrawal, unfortunately. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Obviously, um, it's certainly uptake of um, Agile methodologies in government is certainly a growing area there. And um, I think it'll be interesting to talk about uh, particularly applying that in that risk-averse government con uh, context as well. So I'll hand it over to David now from Doghouse. Thank you very much. I hope everything's working well. Yes, it's um, you're absolutely right. Um, it is a, a really interesting space to be in in terms of applying agile and uh, and understanding those limitations. And that's particularly what Elisa was keen to share today. So she does send her apologies to everybody, um, but she's given me quite a bit of uh, of information to pass on to everybody. So. We'll jump straight into it and uh, and start um, talking about applying agile in those real world scenarios. Uh, we, it's, it's in uh, particular re relation to a recent project that our team delivered for VCAT. Elisa is a um, program manager there at VCAT across all things digital, um, and so she's she's the uh, the person who has to go and uh, convince the board and convince uh, the procurement departments to operate in an ad that their projects will operate in an agile way and um, to trust the processes and to trust her team that um, that deliver them and doghouse were fortunate enough to work alongside them and, um, and and deliver a recent project for them so talking about agile um, we all know it um, you know we all think we know it it's nothing particularly new here to to ourselves and to this audience. Um, but particularly, what are we talking about? What am I talking with you about today? And it's, um, it's, it's agile in the context of the real world constraints of that vendor client relationship, the, the government sector, and with budget and timeframe limitations. Um, they're all things that we have to take into account day in day to day with, with almost all of the the projects we deliver or the engagements we, we get brought in on. Um, and often there can be big expectations with Agile in it. Uh, you know, people have heard a lot about it and keen to operate in that way, but um, there can be misaligned understandings of, of how to apply it in reality. You know, when we look at a lot of projects and engagements with fixed timeframes, fixed budgets, fixed scope, that doesn't equal Agile. And so what can we do to make it work for us and get the, deliver the best results. I mean, ultimately we realize and we, we know that there, there aren't um, endless budgets and endless programs of work. If you operate in that space, um, fantastic, <laughs> good luck. And I hope you have a really good time, but, but we do have to take into account the, that, that define our engagements with our clients. So what are the organizational factors that might limit adoption of Agile? Um, and this is really where Elisa was keen to, to share with the, the audience some of those things which she has worked through in her experience um, in bringing Agile on board um, and delivering successful projects. Um, you know, public and private sector agencies are looking to Agile as the new standard, um, you know, it's, as its principles and the terminology becomes part of the product development vernacular. Um, but if you wrongly apply it in environments with the inability to adapt Agile, it can have detrimental effects on, on trust and throughput and ultimate, the ultimate success of the project. Um, so, so bringing on stakeholders who haven't had in-depth exposure um, to Agile is, is a particular challenge in government where the traditional view of rigorous, uh, risk-averse project governance focuses on defining scope and a solution up front. Um, so how do you build trust and confidence in the process? Um, so some of the factors that, that limit uh, adoption um, is around that not not having a full understanding and not having been through it before. So um, 
with their opportunities to improve the understanding of agile within governance at a leadership governance and procurement level, particularly uh, at initiation, um, beginning with procurement, the requirement, it's often an articulation of a fixed deliverable or fixed deliverables. You know, e example, in this time frame for this budget, you'll get this. But this um, approach isn't aligned with Agile or the, the broader innovation methodologies which which uh, involve discovery, data analysis, feature prioritization and feasibility assessments to determine features and then product, plot a roadmap out for their release. Um, so it'd be great to change the conversation to value, from deliverables to value. What will deliver the greatest value without getting locked into solutions at the initiation stage? They're the conversations which Elisa had focused on getting through and, and working with. I mean, VCAT are uh, um, quite mature mature with Agile now so that they're quite successful in, in across a number of projects and programs of work uh, right through the organisation. And so that, yeah, in the traditional view, um, Agile is sometimes equated with a lack of rigour, you know, it, it being perceived as, as too loosely defined. Um, but conversely, what we have is actually quite it, it are rigorous processes, so that we get to in the in the product sense release early and released often, so that we get to see um, the delivery of the project and the features take shape um, as we go, and that's what builds trust and confidence in the in the process. So a lot of people are asking, well, what are the benefits of adopting it? What are the benefits of running programs and projects utilising these methodologies? And as I said, because of its, its transparency um, and values driven analysis and that emphasising time boxing work to deliver proofs of concept or MVPs we mitigate those risks which are concerns and, and people have been concerned with up front um, and concerns around time blowouts, uh, budget blowouts, these kind of things that it enables you to deliver better services at pace. And that's something which particularly now the government's keen to achieve um, and many organisations are keen to achieve with COVID impacts on business. Uh, and having to do change, pivot and deliver new services or services in new ways uh, and do those quickly. And so putting the time in up front to understand value creation, we're mitigating those risks of not delivering those transformative outcomes that, that we're hoping for at the start of the project. So how do we apply it? Um, a large part of, this, of the success um, that Elisa and the VCAT team went through to get buy-in for this project was educating their stakeholders. There's a lot of education and, and work which went on to support their organisation, the stakeholders, and, and right through the organisation to understand the, the Agile methods so that they're adopted um, and that and through the continual demonstration of their vision, the value that they're delivering and progress then throughout delivery, they could see the trust in the process. If we were constantly showcasing, um, playing, playing back progress reports um, so that they could understand it and build the trust and confidence in the project's design, delivery, and then ultimately what was going to be released and then continually released thereafter. So then we get into uh, some of the nitty gritty about how we do it. How do we 
how do we operate in this in this way to deliver projects? Um, then, in the context of this particular piece of work um, between um, Doghouse and VCAT, which is common for a number of engagements, it's we're integrated as part of a project delivery team, so that we have uh, Doghouse team members um, working together in a in a in a larger um, product team alongside VCAT's um, subject matter experts, uh, business analysts, uh, program leads, delivery leads. So, so we're integrated within um, and, and form one large delivery team. And so that we have the trust to work together, we utilize things like, we call it radical transparency. Um, and it's just about being open and honest. And we know we're usually, uh, like I said, we're usually working to a fixed top line spend. So we have an open and shared view of the burn down or spend of that budget. Um, you know, we're not hiding any numbers or waiting for end of sprint time reports, end of month invoicing to, to know who's been working on what for how long. Um, when we're integrated into that project team, you get the best results. Um, and, and that openness and honesty um, is, is, is a huge part of that. And so the team need to understand what all those expectations are. Um, we have clear expectations set so that between vendor and client, we, we know how each other is engaged and what the premise of the commercial agreement is. Um, so from a, to, from a delivery team point of view, from the vendor to technology provider point of view, um, the development team need to know and understand that their whole, their, their whole days are being bought by the client as part of this relationship. The whole sprints are being bought so that if they need to spend some time brushing up their skills on uh, or their knowledge on a particular framework that they might not have used recently, um, that time that they might spend in the morning getting back up to speed on some some Vue.js, that goes against the project. It's it's um, that they understand how the team the team's time has been procured and what that relationship is. Um, and we're embedded so that the, the client, we're buying sprints of our time together and we're delivering throughput. So if people are sick or they have time off. We manage the impact to the project velocity and we make up the missing days. Um, and we have, and through that we get trust and it's trust that it, trust creates trust. So that the vendor in VCAT and the, the client trust the delivery team that they've engaged to deliver the value. Uh, and then they need to know that they trust that, that they need to understand that features will come, but we need X number of sprints to build velocity to get there. Um, so then once we start getting to that velocity, we can see that there's progress being made and that can be shared through the organization. A little insight into how we do some of that is through sharing um, it's pretty old, pretty simple, but this isn't just time tracking from within the the uh, doghouse team. It's it's open and shared with VCAT. So day to day, I can have a live view of expenditure and burn down. What are we planning to spend per sprint per day, and what are we actually spending? What are we actually consuming in terms of that burn down of that that budget? Um, who is away on what days? So where do we make up time? And through that, what are the results? So you get efficiency when you collaborate together and work in this manner. We get the tailored outcome of, of a product which is ultimately suited because it's been uh, released early and often and the whole organization have been able to see it take shape and you end up with ultimately the most business value 
so if the product, the, the, the site took over two years to deliver from start to finish from VCAT's point of view, from design through to delivery, from, um, the website component, the transformation of the website took approximately about nine months. Um, and as you can see in some of this, this information from uh, Elisa at VCAT, they're very happy with what they've received through that delivery. Um, it's given their, given their customers a simpler, pro, a simpler, um, faster self-service experience. The, their, their customers are able to find what they're looking for a lot more easily. They're, re, they're reducing the volumes on their call centers. And through this, um, through the course of this engagement, we were hit with the, the changes of the working relationship through COVID and having uh, having working on site with the integrated VCAT team to being dispersed and everybody working remotely. And, and not only that, the huge impact that VCAT received in having all of their cases now heard online. Um, and the, uh, the site, the new site that they've launched has been able to support that um, and provide their customers with much better ways of finding the information they require for their trials and reducing the volumes through to the call center at the same time has been quite uh, quite an amazing thing to to deliver so with that let's say thank you for your time and uh jeff if there's any any further comments or feedback that have come through if anyone's got any they'd like they're welcome to to come forward yeah, we've got a question from John about uh, how do you tightly control scope so you don't add any more value than you really need and therefore control expenditure and meet expectations? Um, it is a very good question, a very good point, because we're, we're trying to seek it through this style of engagement, seeking to deliver as much scope and value as we can. Um, we are over the over the course of a project, which might take say nine months in this case, like I said, we take a few sprints to get up and running and we can start to see what kind of throughput we can get. It really takes probably at least four sprints before you start to see what your value is. Um, and you need to understand what scope is achievable. And ultimately we know we, 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 we're not going to be re-engaged if you can't deliver an ultimate deliverable of a of a high functioning, very usable website covering a lot of the features which were agreed up front but not contracted. So the contract is for for time and for um, for time and for the team. So how not to deliver too much scope? Um, it's really key for the your top um, project management. Um, BA and probably tech, probably top technical team to understand the efforts in um, the key features and particularly with the product owner to prioritize the key features that are going to be absolutely required. And then, you know, what might make up an MVP in this context and anything beyond that are sort of our benefits over and above. So real sort of, Prioritization of your key features would be the, the big thing there. Okay. Um, well, we're running close to time now. Um, well, thank you very much for that uh, that talk, David. That was that was really interesting, and I think uh, relevant as most government agencies and departments are now in some form or another going down that path with Agile. Some are more advanced, some are, are still learning, but uh, I think it's really um, illuminating talk and really good. Uh, to keep that discussion going in the government arena. Thanks again. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone.